Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Here's your clicker. Well, thank you so much. I'm honored to be here. What a fabulous crowd. Uh, and thank you so much to, to the organizers. You've done a wonderful job. So, so congratulations to everybody for doing this. Um, I want to first say just a word of um, homage to Dean Ornish, who I know just spoke. But in case anybody wasn't paying attention, I just wanted to mention kind of the miracle that, that this man did, because he really inspired me. You know, he brought in people who were perhaps, uh -oh, were perhaps expecting that they would need uh, drugs or surgery or some kind of roto-rooter to clean out their arteries again. And with these simple four steps, vegetarian foods, half-hour walk, manage stress, which is why nobody in Hampton Roads was in the study, um, <laughs> avoid tobacco, he was able to get these amazing changes where Cholesterol dropped dramatically, LDL, bad cholesterol, dropped 37%. That's what a, a statin would do, but he did this with beans and rice and asparagus. Um, people lost weight. Some people were already skinny, so they didn't lose weight, but others were quite heavy. And the average person lost 22 pounds without counting calories. And then what made medical history was the angiograms that he did, where you measure that tiny trickle of blood that gets through the coronary arteries, and comparing the results after a year to the results at the beginning showed that the arteries were actually opening up, which we, we thought was not possible. They were opening up so much that you could see a measurable difference in 82% of the patients, no surgery, no medication, nothing, just these simple diet and lifestyle choices. And so my research team asked the question, what if I don't have heart disease? What if I just want to lose some weight? Or what if I need to lose a lot of weight? So we brought in 64 women. They were all over the age of menopause. They had all done every diet known to humanity. They had done Atkins and South Beach and Jenny Craig and Nutrisystem and everything else. And they all felt stuck. And we said, well, there are two rules. No animal products. And let's keep oils to a bare minimum. And that was surprising to people because they were expecting to have to count calories and eat tiny portions or sweat off the pounds. And th there were just two rules, no animal products, keep oils very low. We said, don't change your exercise patterns at all because we're trying to focus on, on what diet changes will do. And it was a 22-week study, I'm sorry, 14-week study in this one and a two-year follow-up afterwards. And when the patients came in, we said, here's what we're going to be doing. We're going to use the power plate. That means vegetables and fruits and grains and legumes. What are legumes? Beans, peas, lentils, foods that grow in a pod. And um, our research participants thought, uh-oh, you're going to have me eating pancakes with syrup. And I can eat all the chili I want. And I can eat all the pasta I want. And they thought they'd gain a huge amount of weight. But what happened is that 14 weeks, the average person had actually not gained weight. They'd lost 13 pounds on average. And we did glucose tolerance testing, where we assessed their insulin sensitivity. And we found that it actually measurably improved. And then we tracked people. Sorry, my clicker's a little hypothyroid here. Um, um, we tracked them for two, two additional years, and what we found is that they never put the weight back on. Unlike every other diet they had ever been on, they were skinnier at a year than at the beginning and skinnier at two years than one year. So it was like a one-way street. And that's because you're not making a quantitative change. Only eat this much. We're making a qualitative change where we're eating a different kind of food. So why does this happen? Well, the first reason is fiber. You're eating plants. And plants, oops, sorry. Uh, plants all have fiber. So if you're eating vegetables and fruits and whole grains and beans, everything that goes into your mouth is going to have some fiber in it. Fiber has effectively no calories, but it fills you up. And so you think you're eating the same amount of food, but you're actually eating less than you were before when you're eating cheese and meat. And the other thing is that fat has nine calories per gram, and you're not eating very much fat. 
And we actually ask all of our participants to tattoo this on their forearm. Fat has nine calories per gram because that means animal fat, beef fat, pork fat, chicken fat, fish fat. It means oils, corn oil, safflower oil, olive oil, extra virgin olive oil. Nine calories per gram. So if I want to lose weight, we're going to keep those very low. Um, but carbohydrate has only four calories in a gram. And so for all the people who are afraid of carbohydrate, it's a really low calorie food, which is why in Japan, before McDonald's arrived, the diet was rice-based, huge amounts of rice and noodles, and they were the skinniest, longest-lived people on the planet. Okay, so. The first mechanism, the reason people lose weight, is because the foods are high in fiber and they're very low in fat, people just tend to eat less even though they think they're eating more. This is a technique called indirect calorimetry. Uh, the patients come in and we put a plastic bubble over their face and shoulders and what we're doing is measuring how much oxygen you're consuming minute by minute and how much carbon dioxide you're putting out. And with some really simple arithmetic, that shows me how fast you're burning calories. So the patients come in, and they hadn't had breakfast yet. And they've got a really low metabolism. And in fact, they'll say, you don't even need to measure. I can tell you, I don't have a metabolism at all. When I was 16, I could eat anything. But now, I just look at food, and I gain weight. Um, so we measure their resting metabolic rate. And it is low. And then they have breakfast. And what we see is that over the next three hours or more, their metabolism rises. And that's because you're absorbing nutrients, you're metabolizing those nutrients, you're building up body heat, you're using more oxygen to do all of that. And that will continue. But then, you begin a completely plant-based diet, come back in, lie down on the same table, we put the same thing over your, your face and we're measuring again your met metabolic rate. And what we discover is that your metabolism has increased, not a lot, but it's increased about 16%. But 16% increase after breakfast, after lunch, after dinner, 365 days a year. That's another big reason why people on plant-based diets lose weight. So, so reason number one is that they're just not eating as much food even though they think they are. The second reason is they're actually burning calories just a little bit faster. It's kind of like setting the idle in your car just 16% faster so you're burning through fuel. So why does that happen? So what I'm suggesting is that their metabolism had been artificially suppressed before. They were eating a lot of fatty foods and that interfered with their metabolism. Well, how could that be? Let me walk you through this. At Pennington Biomedical Research Center, this is in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, researchers tested a high fat diet, 50% fat, in volunteers for just three days. And what they discovered is that their mitochondrial biogenesis was suppressed. Let me tell you what I mean by that. You know your cells, they have mitochondria in them. You remember this from high school biology? Those mitochondria are your little burners. They are there to burn calories. They turn sugar into energy or fat into energy. And the number of mitochondria you have is not constant. It can change. If you need more energy, your body can make more mitochondria. If you need less, your body can coalesce the mitochondria and start getting rid of them. So the point of this experiment was they brought in individuals and for three days they gave them extra fat and their body stopped making so many mitochondria. What does that mean? It means their, their ability to burn energy, to produce energy diminishes. So, okay, so this is a, a cell. Say this is a muscle cell. There's some mitochondria. You got lots of them. But there's something else there. There's fat. It's building up. Now, doctors hate words like fat. It's got one syllable. Three letters. So we'll call it intramyocellular lipid, and now we're on to something. Um, <laughs> fat, it, intra means inside. Myo means muscle. Cellular means cellular. Uh, lipid means fat. Intramyocellular lipid is fat inside the cell. So I'm going out to lunch. I'm going to have a ham sandwich with extra cheese and lots of mayo, and some of that fat gets into the cell. It starts building up inside my cells. When you get the fat out of your cells, 
it boosts your after meal calorie burn. And so what we think is happening is that a vegan diet simply boosts your metabolic burn so, uh, so that you can burn calories a little bit better. Okay. So there's another possibility. You know how in your intestinal tract, there are bacteria there. That's the microbiome. And the foods you eat will affect your microbiome in various ways. And researchers have started to think, hmm, maybe some of the products of those bacteria are getting into our bloodstream and they're poisoning our body. Here's, here, here's what it is. You see at the top of that slide, that's the, the inside of your intestinal tract. And you see there's a blood vessel passing by at the bottom. And bacteria produce what are called endotoxins. And the endotoxin made by the bacteria can sneak through into your bloodstream. And the question is, could fatty foods make that more likely to happen so that the endotoxin is getting into my blood and it's damaging my metabolism in some kind of way? And that is what we, in fact, think is happening. So this was a study done at Virginia Tech University, and they had the idea that a high-fat diet might actually disrupt that intestinal barrier and that that, in turn, could cause the endotoxin to enter the bloodstream. Or fat might actually escort the endotoxin in directly, but in either case, it disrupts your cells. Is this true? Well, they fed individuals a 55% fat diet for five days, and what they showed is before the high-fat diet, their endotoxin, there was not a lot of endotoxin in their blood, and after the high-fat diet, there was a lot of endotoxin in the blood. So this proves the first part of that. The bacterial products are getting into the blood. And is this goofing up my metabolism? Yes, it is. The, the two bars on the left, that's before the high-fat diet. When you eat a meal, your metabolism will bounce right up. That's normal. That should happen. The second two bars, that's after the high-fat diet. And what you discover is that your metabolism doesn't bounce up very much. You get the idea? So what the, the researchers are saying is, you're eating all these fatty foods, and we think, oh, our, our body will just get rid of them. Uh-uh. As they're going through your digestive tract, they appear to be causing endotoxins from the bacteria to get into your circulation. That poisons your metabolism. That's working against you. So why does a low-fat vegan diet cause people to lose weight? Well, because you're eating less food, thinking you're eating more, and your metabolism is improved because you're getting rid of these problems. Okay, so in 2003, the National Institutes of Health gave my research team a grant to try to test this approach for type 2 diabetes. And it was a randomized trial comparing a low-fat vegan diet to what I'm going to call the ADA guidelines. And the low-fat vegan diet means no animal products, keeping oils really low, and the ADA uh, guidelines that I'm describing here were back when we began this, the American Diabetes Association really said for most people with diabetes, they need to cut calories. Because to lose weight, you've just got to cut calories. If you eat 2,000 calories a day, we're going to cut you down to 1,500. That'll help you lose weight. And you need to keep carbohydrate fairly steady throughout the day. Don't ever have a big carb fest. That was, th those were sort of the rules. So that was our control group. Uh, it was a 22-week study, so call it, what, five months? and one-year follow-up. And to cut to the chase, the test that we use to track blood sugar control is hemoglobin A1C, or just A1C for short. And on this slide, I'm showing the A1C values for the people who made no changes in their medication or anything else. And it's, if you have diabetes, we want to keep it below 7. Our people were not below 7. They were around 8 to start. And the red line here is the ADA group, and they did very well. They dropped about 0.4 absolute percentage points, which is great. But the blue line is the people on the plant-based diet. And as you can see, they dropped by about 1.2 absolute percentage points or, or even a little bit more. Um, and this was without any medication change, without any exercise. This was just from healthy eating. Now, we tracked them for an additional year, and there was some give back where you can see they started to, to lose some of their benefit. The ADA group ended up really where they started. Uh, with the vegan group, there was some give back, but they still stayed better than where they had been. Um, and you're familiar with LDL, cholesterol, low-density lipoprotein, um, bad cholesterol. It won't surprise you. It drops very, very predictably when people are not eating cholesterol anymore, which is only in animal products, and when they're not eating animal fat. 
And now when we tracked body weight, we saw that both groups lost weight and there wasn't a significant difference between the two groups. However, what was noteworthy is that when we tracked our people for a year and a half, the vegan group lost slightly more weight than the, than the ADA group, despite the fact that they didn't have any calorie restriction at all. The people on the, in the ADA group were told, you've got to eat 500 calories a day less. They sat down with a dietitian who gave them um, a menu that added up to not enough food to make them satisfied, and you have to eat that way until you reach your goal weight, which for most people is never. Um, and it gets really frustrating by about Wednesday, you're ready to eat the sofa. Um, and with the vegan group, they were told, eat pancakes, eat spaghetti, eat all you want, and they lose more weight. So we don't use calorie restrictions at all for anybody. Um, we, just, we, tr get, we encourage people to follow a healthier quality of diet, and that takes care of it. Okay, uh, let me share with you a couple of experiences. This is Vance. Vance came into our study. He, had, he was a policeman in Washington. And he said, I know all about diabetes because it was up and down his family tree. He said, this diabetes means you could lose a leg, you could go blind. Vance's father was dead at age 30. Vance was 31 when he was diagnosed and he was in his late 30s when he came to see us. Uh, but he started the diet, he lost 60 pounds over the course of about a year. He stopped his diabetes medications and his A1C had been nine and a half, which is terrible and it fell to 5.3, which is completely normal. And I want to tell you that when I got his results, um, this was back um, 14, 15 years ago, when diabetes was considered a one-way street. Once you're diabetic, you will always be diabetic. And yet here was a guy in front of me who was on no medications for his diabetes and he didn't have a high blood sugar. He could, he could go into any clinic in the world and they wouldn't diagnose him as, as having this disease. And the question was, can I tell him that he doesn't have diabetes anymore? And um, I have to say, we, over time we have come to see that this can happen. Um, it's, and it's not a rare thing that a person can actually get over their, over their, their uh, diabetes. Um, and by the way, when I was asking if I could share his experience with you, he said, make sure you tell everybody that my erectile dysfunction went away as well. So. <laughs> now, let me say a word about that. Um, the guy goes into the doctor's office and he says, doctor, um, how do I put this? I have, I got, I got problem with, with my nature. And the doctor will give him a prescription for Viagra. Now, let's go back for a minute, though. Erectile dysfunction is not caused by performance anxiety in a, in a middle-aged man. It's caused by a lack of blood flow. Because a man's sexual anatomy is a hydraulic system that requires good blood flow for it to work properly. It was obviously devised on a Monday because things are going wrong with it all the time, but if you don't have adequate blood flow, it just will not work. So, he's, he, guys in his mid-50s say he's got atherosclerosis in his coronary arteries, meaning he's headed for a heart attack. He's got it, the same thing in his brain. The carotids are starting to get narrow. It happens in the arteries all over his body. And so, sexual dysfunction in a man should never be treated with a Viagra prescription or anything else without letting the patient know that in all likelihood he has serious atherosclerosis and will have a heart attack or a stroke within fairly few years if he does not make bigger changes than this. That person's got to be counseled on a healthy plant-based diet. If he smokes, you've got to have a serious discussion about that. This is a heart attack waiting to happen. And you see these commercials about on TV um, with, you know, you could sit in two tubs and da da da, all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, your seven year old daughter comes in the, in the kitchen and says, What's an erection lasting more than four hours? You know, um, this is the world that we live in. Um, but this is atherosclerosis and should be treated as such. Okay. Uh, Nancy was in the same study. She lost about 40 pounds in the same way. She stopped her diabetes medications. Her A1C fell to 6.8, which is good, but she illustrates the point. She still has diabetes. So not everyone is going to have their diabetes go away, but it improves. Um, you can dramatically reduce the risk 
of any kind of complications of diabetes, but treat it right away. If, if a person has had diabetes for 20, 25, 30 years, the likelihood of making it completely go away is reduced because the beta cells of the pancreas are just not producing insulin as much as they used to. Okay? But she did have another interesting experience. Um, she came running into our research center to say, I was cooking spaghetti, which by the way, if you have diabetes, that alone is amazing. Um, and she, she had rheumatoid arthritis. And if any of you have rheumatoid arthritis, um, you know that whoever makes those vacuum-packed jars for spaghetti sauce and things, they are sadists. You can't get them open. Um, but she just cracked the jar open, and she poured out the, the sauce, and she realized her joints stopped hurting. What was that about? Well, that's a whole other topic, but I wrote a book in 1998 called Foods That Fight Pain because I had found that very common kinds of pain like menstrual pain or migraines or rheumatoid arthritis can be affected by food. And inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, are, it's, it's an autoimmune condition where the body is making antibodies to something that has entered. And now those antibodies are attacking the synovial membranes that line the joints. Well, what is that antigen? It could be dairy. It could be other things. The most common one is dairy, and when it's gone from the diet, many people's arthritis improves or just goes away, okay? Um, don't take this on faith. The patient can test it out for themselves, and they can bring the suspect foods in and out of the diet, and pretty soon they'll see the ones that are affecting them. Okay, this is my most important slide. I, I want to walk you through um, the cause of type 2 diabetes. If you are a caregiver, when you're explaining to an individual why we use a plant-based diet, I would suggest that you take an 8.5 by 11 piece of paper and draw this out for the patient and hand it to them with your phone number. Um, this is a muscle cell. The reason I'm showing you a muscle cell is that's where glucose is going. The sugar that's in your blood is trying to get into your muscles. It's like gasoline trying to go into your gas tank to power your engine. Uh, glucose is gasoline for your cells. If it can't get into the cells, it just circulates in the blood and causes trouble. So there's glucose up on the upper left, and it's trying to get into the cell. It can get in there with the help of a key, which is insulin. The insulin is made in the pancreas, and like a key in a lock, the insulin attaches to those red receptors, and when that happens, it signals the insulin to come in through those little channels, and it goes right into the cell, and that's all normal. Now, if a person has type 2 diabetes, they've got glucose, they've got insulin, they've got insulin receptors, all that is completely normal. What is not normal is that arrow, that's, that signaling process, that insulin signaling is not working. It's like putting the key in a lock and the engine just won't start or your front door lock won't open because somebody put chewing gum in your lock. The lock is gummed up. There's nothing wrong with your key. So what am I going to do? Well, if you look inside the cell, you see our old enemy intramyocellular lipid goofing us up again. And that can be from dairy fat, beef fat, Fish oil, olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, extra extra virgin olive oil. Doesn't care. It doesn't matter how much you paid for the bottle or whether it came from Tuscany or not. It gets inside the cell very quickly after the meal, and it interferes with insulin's action. So, oh, doctor, that's why you want me to follow a vegan diet. Because how much animal fat is there in a vegan diet? There isn't any. And that's why you're teaching me non-oil cooking techniques, because over time, that fat's going to start to disappear. So let me share with you a study that was done by Jerry Shulman and Kit Peterson at Yale University. This was a groundbreaking study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine back in 1994. Uh, I'm sorry, 2004. What they did is they brought in 26 healthy people. They didn't have diabetes. They did a glucose tolerance test. That's where you drink 75 grams of this syrupy goo and then they stick you in the arm every half hour and, and track your glucose levels and your insulin levels. And based on the results of this, some of the people were normal. They were insulin sensitive. Some of the people were not. They were already insulin resistant. And so then what they did is they tested these groups. The insulin sensitive controls, the healthy people, were compared with the insulin resistant people. And they picked folks who had a family history of diabetes, either parent or grandparent. They were young, 28 and 26. They were not heavy. The insulin-resistant people, slightly heavier, but nobody in there was overweight. 
um, their A1C levels were completely normal. Nobody had diabetes. But then they sent them into an MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, with MR spectroscopy. You can look inside the muscle cells. And there you see something very troubling. Each dot here is a person. This is how much intramyocellular lipid was building up in their muscle cells. And that's, on the left is the controls who are healthy, on the right is the insulin resistant people. What you're seeing is that they, they're young, they're skinny, they're healthy, they don't have diabetes. Nobody even mentioned that word, but they've got fat building up inside their cells. And then their mitochondria are getting impaired. They're not working as well. They're not going to have diabetes for another 10 years or 15 years. But the process has started when they're young and thin. Um, it starts for many kids when they're in high school. Okay? Is this making sense? All right. So inside that cell, what I want to do is be on a diet that cleans that fat out. And the, early, the sooner you do that, the better off you're going to be. Okay. All right. Now I'd like to talk to you about your car insurance. Geico's national headquarters is about four blocks from my office. And back in about 2006, I was talking with their health director who said, Dr. Barnard, I've got 2,500 people in this building. We are self-insured. We've got people on statins. We've got people on insulin. We are hem hemorrhaging health care costs. What if we do your program at Geico? I said, fabulous, let's do it as a study. So what we did is we did a randomized, or not a randomized study, we did a comparison of this facility, which is in the Washington, D.C. area, to another facility in Fredericksburg, Virginia. And all we did was we asked the cafeteria manager to serve vegan food, in addition to whatever else they were serving. They had to have it available. And the second thing was anybody who wanted to try the diet could sign up and we would give them every week a lunch and learn or support group or cooking class, whatever you want to call it. They came in once a week at lunch. That was the whole deal. And it worked really, really well. So Geico said, you know, we got more Geico places than that. Let's do it in 10 different cities. So we did, and, and we, including Dallas, Texas, and Macon, Georgia, and San Diego, and all kinds of places. And I have to say, for some of the cafeteria managers, um, it was a little bit of a new idea for them. Um, What can, I, what can I say? It took him a little while to figure out that vegan means don't have the bacon and cheese, but anyway, what you would expect to happen, happened, which is that if people did not go on the diet, they didn't lose any weight. If they did go on the diet, they lost weight really, really well. Um, the hemoglobin A1C and people with diabetes just dropped. And it has become very, very predictable that this will happen now. Um, I have to say our research uh, instructors kept coming back to the office each week and they would just sing the praises of the people at Geico. You know, they're so enthusiastic, they're so into this, they're doing a great job, except for two of them. There's Hillary and there's Bruce. They're the youngest people in the study. They come every single week to the, to the classes, but they sit in the back of the room and they don't pay any attention to, the, to what's going on. All they do is chatter and they pass notes back and forth and gaze into each other's eyes and they distract everybody else. And I don't see why they keep coming. And every week I kept hearing about Hillary and Bruce being these bad participants. Well, you can misjudge people. And our instructors misjudged Hillary and Bruce. They did distract people and they did talk a lot. But what they were talking about was what foods they were going to pick up at the store on the way home and how they were going to convince her parents to go vegan with them and how they were going to have a vegan Thanksgiving for all their friends. And they were making their shopping lists and they were really into it. And a year later, Bruce sent me this picture. Hillary's lost 85 pounds. Bruce has lost 100 pounds. Um, and I want to tell you that when, when Bruce sent me this picture, he said, you know, when you have trouble losing weight, and you're not like all the success stories that you see on TV. You think, you don't think there's something wrong with the diet. You think there's something wrong with you. They do well. What's wrong with me? Well, maybe I don't have uh, the willpower that I should have. Maybe it was my bad childhood. Maybe I'm just kind of a worm. I don't know. A and it bleeds into every other aspect of your life. It's not just that you're having trouble losing weight. Maybe I'm not such a hot employee. 
Uh, maybe I'm not a very good parent. Um, this sense of failure pervades your whole life. And the more diets you fail at, the, the worse it gets. And then suddenly you realize it wasn't you. It was a diet that said, starve it off, don't eat carbohydrates, and all these things that have nothing to do with human nature or human biology. And when you're suddenly putting in your body the fuel that you were actually designed for, it's like putting the right fuel into your car. If you've been putting diesel in your car and it's the exhaust is terrible and the ride is rough and you suddenly put in the, the fuel that it's really designed for, like unleaded and everything sorts itself out, that's what happens when you put the fuel in that your body really was hoping you would do. And when you can let that weight melt away and let your health come back, then you get a sense of success that pervades other aspects of your life. Maybe I can do some stuff. Maybe there are things I can do. And one of the things they discovered they could do was exercise. Once they lost that weight, they realized they wanted, they, they, they felt energetic. And they had never exercised before, but now they took it up and Bruce sent me this picture the day they ran their first half marathon. Um, by the way, when we're speaking of diabetes, you know that diabetes increases the risk of eye problems and kidney problems. And it can damage the circulation to your legs and your feet. But it also attacks the brain. This was a study done in Japan where individuals were tested to see if they had diabetes or not, and those who did had double the risk of Alzheimer's compared to those who didn't. And happily, the approach to Alzheimer's is surprisingly similar to the approach to diabetes. This is in Chicago at the Chicago Health and Aging Project. They brought in individuals who were healthy and they tracked what they were eating, and they wanted to see if foods could affect brain function. And let me share with you that the foods they first picked on were things that I knew all about as a kid growing up in Fargo, North Dakota. Anybody been there? Seen the movie? Okay. Uh, my mom had five kids. We'd wake up to the smell of bacon wafting up. And we'd come down, my mother would be taking a fork and she'd pull the bacon strips out of the frying pan and put them on a paper t towel to kind of cool down. And then when all the bacon was out of the pan, she had this hot grease in the pan. You don't want to throw that away, that's good bacon grease. So she would lift that hot pan and she'd pour it into a jar to save the grease. Did your mom do this too? And the, the jar did not go in the refrigerator, she just put it on the shelf because when bacon grease cools down, what happens to it? It solidifies. And that's a sign that it's loaded with saturated fat. And the number one source of saturated fat is not bacon, it's actually dairy products. Meat's number two. So in Chicago, some of the people ate relatively little saturated fat, 13 grams a day. Some ate about twice as much, about 25. When you look at the Alzheimer's risk of these two groups, dramatically different. Um, eating more saturated fat would more than double the risk of Alzheimer's. The same is true with trans fats. Uh, used in a lot of snack foods. And what we think is going on is that the bad fat pushes your cholesterol level up, and the higher your cholesterol, that's the further out you are on the right of this slide, the higher your risk of Alzheimer's. The, the, the lesson is, whatever is bad for the heart is bad for the brain. Smoking is bad for the heart. Eating lard is bad for the heart. Being sedentary is bad for the heart. All those things are bad for the brain, too. The good news is that when you are helping your heart, when you are attacking your diabetes with a healthy diet, your brain says, I'm so glad you're doing this because it puts Alzheimer's a little bit more uh, out of your reach. Okay, so a healthy diet, fruits, grains, vegetables, legumes. Now, when you prescribe this to a patient, they might say, wait a minute, doc, where am I gonna get my protein? Are you sick of that question? Um, well, patients will ask it, and let me just walk you through some numbers. Um, because people imagine, at least when I was a kid, this, we grew up with the idea that you've got meat, and then you've got vegetables, but, but the protein is in the meat, and the vegetables might have vitamins or fiber, but they don't have any protein. Okay, the average person might eat roughly 2,000 calories a day. And the government would say a woman needs about 46 grams of protein, a man 56. So what if I ate, as an experiment, 2,000 calories of just broccoli? Not that you would ever do this, but as an experiment, if all you ate on a day was just broccoli, but you ate your normal meal size, you would get 146 grams of pure protein just from broccoli. Next day, let's do it with lentils. Just lentils, but 2,000 calories worth. You're now getting 157 grams of pure protein. 
Well, hopefully you're not doing that. But what if you had some broccoli, some lentils, some rice, some fruits, other foods? What you discover is that you're getting more than enough complete protein, all the essential amino acids in the proportions your body needs without even thinking about it. So, in other words, forget protein. It is a non-issue. Calcium is an issue, but a really easy one. People think of calcium as coming from what? Dairy products, milk products. Well, the cow does not make calcium. Calcium is an element. It's in the ground. So when grass grows, its roots pull up the calcium and it gets into the grass and the cow eats the leaves of the grass and some of it gets into the milk and you will absorb about 30% of the calcium in the, in the milk. 32% to be exact. Wait, wait, let's take out the middleman. What if I'm eating the, hopefully not grass, but things that come out of the earth directly? Maybe it's broccoli, maybe it's Brussels sprouts or kale or collards or something like that. And you're eating, that's what nature thought you were going to eat. And we have the ability to absorb it in a bigger fraction than we can absorb from milk. It varies. Now, some plants like spinach are kind of selfish. They have a very uh, low absorption fraction, but others are very, very high. Okay, um, now vitamin B12, very important. Very easy, but very important. Vitamin B12 is needed for healthy nerves and healthy blood. And it's not made by animals or by plants. It's made by bacteria. And some people will say, prior to the advent of modern hygiene, the bacteria in the soil or on the foods that we would, would eat uh, might give us the 2.4 micrograms that we need. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, meat eaters will get some B12 because the in, in their intestinal tract of a cow, there are bacteria that make B12, and some of it gets in the meat, and some gets in the dairy. However, to absorb that B12, you have to have, uh, first of all, you have to have stomach acid to pull the B12 off the protein, and then you need something called intrinsic factor to absorb it. A lot of people over 50 are not making stomach acid very well. And if you're on an acid blocker, that's for sure. And if you're on metformin, that interferes with B12 absorption too. So most of the people who end up low in B12 are not people on a vegan diet. They're people who are on medications or are over 50. But if you're on a vegan diet, you're not getting animal products as a source, you must supplement B12. It's at every drug store, every health food store. Just take the smallest amount you, you can. The amount you actually need is 2.4 micrograms. It's in every one a day vitamin you ever took. It's supplemented in lots of foods, but you should supplement just to be sure, okay? Um, and by now, your friends, when you go home and speak with them about this diet, they will say, what are you talking about? Human beings are carnivores. We're meat eaters. We all grew up as meat eaters. And let me put a question mark on that. It is true that when you look at the caves of France and Spain, you do see these optimistic drawings of people who thought maybe today we'll have a successful hunt. But if you look a little bit more broadly at our uh, great ape cousins, what you discover is they're not eating ice cream. <laughs> In fact, they eat fruit and all kinds of things that they can pull with their hands. And with, with, with very few exceptions, they don't eat meat. Uh, very, very few exceptions. I'm going to suggest that maybe people are really herbivores. And to help me prove that, I have three scientific tests. Do you know the dental test? The dental test? Um, you, you wait for your cat to yawn. And you look in your cat's mouth, and what you see are these razor blades that they use to kill prey and to remove the hide and the muscles. And then you stumble into the bathroom and look in the mirror at your own teeth, and what you discover is that your canine teeth are no longer than your incisors. And that change occurred at least three and a half million years ago. Okay? That is an herbivore's mouth. Um, do you know the bunny test? No? The bunny test? You take a bunny. And you put the bunny in front of your cat. <laughs> and what you discover is that your cat, who may never have seen a bunny and might be only six or eight months old, the, 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 the brain in the cat is hardwired to devour that bunny. You put the very same bunny in front of a baby or a toddler. And what they will say is, bunny. Not in a million years will their brain send a signal saying, I shall eat him. And, and in, fact, in fact, 
If a cat is walking down the sidewalk and they see a, a bird flopping around because the bird's broken his wing, the cat is going to think, how propitious. Food has come to me. And they will pounce on him and eat him. But you could be the most hard-hearted human being in the world. You could be a lobbyist. Um, <laughs> if you see... If you, if you see a, a bird flopping around with a broken wing, do you ever think, like, give me some bread and mayo. This is going to really work out fine. No, you're an herbivore. This just doesn't happen. Your brain is not hardwired that way. Um, the, third, do you, okay, the third scientific test. Do you know the box test? No? You take a box, and the box had a computer or a camera, some kind of electronics in it. And in the bottom of the box is something called silica gel. And what's that for? Keep it dry, right? Well, the makers of silica gel are very wise observers of human behavior. They have written three words on every single packet. <laughs> Do not eat. What does this tell us? By nature, we are herbivores. But we put any darn thing in our mouth unless you specifically tell us not to. And that's what's happened. If you see what kids are eating these days, it's, it should have a label saying, do not eat. All right. So, this is a carnivore. That is not. A carnivore on the left has big ears to track where prey is. I can hear them in the distance. You know, you know dogs, they can, they can hear frequencies that are outside of human hearing. You know what I'm talking about. And their nose is, is so powerful that they can tell where prey has been. Long after prey has left, they can track prey. They're so good, they can detect explosives at the airport. And, um, and in fact, I've got to tell you, they can detect a banana that you brought back from your trip to, from, to Costa Rica that you forgot was in your luggage. They're really good. Um, now, human beings have cute noses and cute little ears, but they don't really, can't really track prey. You can't really smell where things have been, and that's okay, because you don't have to sneak up on a strawberry. It's just like really simple. You know, if you're an herbivore, you don't need that kind of sensation, but your eyes, Unlike a dog or unlike a cat, you have color vision that is very acute. So you can recognize beta carotene across the room. It's orange. You can recognize lycopene across the room. That's in tomatoes. These are antioxidants. The anthocyanins that give grapes and blueberries their color, their color. these are antioxidants that your brain sees and, and interprets as positive, and we bring them into our diet. Unlike your cat who's looking for motion because your cat's a carnivore. Okay? Make sense? Right, of course, we, now we take those colors, we put them in an M&M's bag, but you get the idea. <laughs> All right, so I asked the paleoanthropologist Richard Leakey, how did people become carnivores? And what he told me is, Neil, we are not carnivores. We have never been carnivores, but the Stone Age gave us arrowheads and axes and the ability to kill prey. So an animal who's not particularly fast, doesn't have sharp teeth, can eat like a carnivore, but we have pre-Stone Age coronary arteries. So, when we talk about influencing decision-making in ourselves, in our families, let me give you a few important truths. Logic plays almost no role in human behavior. <laughs> what makes a lot of difference is, for when I'm picking up my breakfast, is the culture that I grew up in, what, what we ate, or noise like advertising, and maybe some ideas like wishful thinking and money and what I'm addicted to or something like that. That's what determines what we have for breakfast. And so you're explaining to somebody very logically about what they ought to be eating. And here's what happens in their brain. Okay, for neuroanatomists, you know this is true. You get an idea in the brain. The ideatron issues the ideas like, if I stop eating meat. Maybe that'll be good for my coronary arteries. Might be good for the environment. Maybe the animals would, would like not having their throat slit too. This is an interesting idea. But as soon as you get these ideas, they irritate the famiglia. And the famiglia then, then triggers the don't do a terry gland, which <laughs> then sends into the brain ignorphins, and the ignorphins wipe out the idea. And you will have this experience when you talk to people about a plant-based diet. Within about 30 seconds, this whole process will have completed, and out from the mouth will come, where do you get your protein? <laughs> and they are rejecting this threat to the famiglia. Okay? All right. So if you think, all right, I can, I can overcome this. I'd like to start the diet. Here's how you do it. We break it into two steps. I've never seen anyone unable to do it. Step one, check out the possibilities. Don't take anything else. Don't take anything out of your diet. Just take a week to see what you could eat. 
Um, take a piece of paper and write breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack on the paper, and take seven days and fill it in with plant-based options you'd like to try. So, for example, if you never tasted almond milk on your corn flakes and it's always been whole milk, now is the time to buy it and try it. Um, if you haven't had oatmeal since you were a kid, let's go pick some up and see if we still like it. Um, and then you do the same for lunch and try different things. And you try it also at restaurants. See if there are, sorry, see if there are foods that you might like at your favorite Italian place. And the answer is, of course, they've got things. Um, go to a Mexican place and they'll make you bean burritos and veggie fajitas. Uh, Chinese restaurants have lots of choices, of course, rice and vegetables and tofu dishes. And then if you're going to a sushi bar, um, they will be more than happy to make you vegetable sushi. Um, Subway will be more than happy to pile it high with all the veggies. And Taco Bell is not the pinnacle of culinary art, but it is more, they are more than happy to give you a bean burrito and hold the cheese. It'll be plant-based and fine. Seven days, you got it down. Now take three weeks and do it a three-week test drive. And during these three weeks, make it all vegan, all the time, with no exception, and two things will happen. At the end of three weeks, you'll discover you're physically changed, your health is better. The second thing is your tastes are changing. And you didn't expect that, but if you haven't had cheese and things for about three weeks, you discover you kind of can leave it behind. And you're liking the taste of the new foods that come in. And you, um, three weeks is really about all it takes. We have some resources that I'd like to share with you. We have our 21-day vegan kickstart program. Um, you can go to this address, pcrm.org. It's totally free. And every day you'll get an email with menus and recipes and cooking videos. Um, we have a free app for iPhones, um, also Androids. And it's in English, it's in Spanish, it's in Mandarin. We have a Japanese program and also a program for people from the Indian subcontinent with all Indian ingredients. Um, let me brag about two books that um, this cookbook just came out, and I want to tip my hat to Drina Burton, who did these wonderful recipes uh, for my Reversing Diabetes cookbook. And on December 24th, I have the skinniest, smallest, shortest, cheapest book anyone ever wrote called The Vegan Starter Kit. And I'm releasing this because I want to have something that a person can read in less than an hour about how to get started. So you'll see that on Amazon now. Please order 25 copies and give away 24 of them to people who need this. Um, the last thing that I just want to say is I hope you find this helpful, but more important than anything is to spread the word because most people still don't know how foods can help re revolutionize their health. And the more we spread the word, the more lives we'll save. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, thank you for a fantastic talk, as well as very entertaining, I have to say. Those slides are great. We'll open up the floor for questions for about the next 20 minutes. Good. I um, see one here. But, but, and hold your hands up high, because I know it's hard to see with us with the light shining in. Before we, oh. do, before we do, can I bring Bob Please? Blackburn yes. up to the stage? Um, I was talking to Bob before, just before I came out, and he, he has shared a story with me that I'd like him to share with you, if you, if you don't mind. Bob? It's an honor to be here with someone that saved my life. My name is Bob Blackburn, and two years ago, I was 330 pounds, and I was diagnosed as a type 2 diabetic at the VA hospital in Hampton. In the last two years, I've lost 130 pounds. They took diabetes out of my record January of this year. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a PhD, not an MD. I have three letters after my name. L-M-T stands for love my toes. I came into this world with 10 digits in my hands and 10 on my feet, and I'm leaving with them. <laughs> this isn't easy. It's not easy to, I'm an Italian kid from Boston. 
I put olive oil on breakfast cereal. <laughs> I've never used a t tablespoon of anything. It's three trips around the pan, you put about 800 calories on your zucchini. <laughs> if it wasn't for Dr. Bonnet, seriously, I, I'd probably be like my father, dead at 53. I was 53 years old when I got di uh, diagnosed. My oldest son was 14. My father died at 53. I was 14. Reality was real, if you know what I mean. I came home diagnosed. I called a friend of mine, John Dempsey, who's a, a fellow that I knew had lost a lot of weight uh, eating plant based and I called him. I said, what do I do? He says, Google Dr. Barnard. I'm like, who's that? <laughs> there he is. <laughs> I read, I literally downloaded his book, The Reversing Diabetes. If you haven't read it, read it. If you haven't prescribed it, do it. Because it's, it's written for real people. I read the book literally twice that night woke up the next morning and I started eating low-fat, plant-based, vegan diet, whatever that was. I, I can promise you if I was ever to write a blog, it would be the unlikely diabetic. I'm sorry, the unlikely vegan. Because if it mooed or clawed or crawled or whatever, I ate it. I was a United States Marine and a professional wrestler. What I am now is a non-diabetic, grateful human being to that man right there. I, I want to salute you. You know, people come in and they, they give of their time as uh, research participants and, and so forth. But when a person has actually gone through this and lived it um, with whatever fears or trepidation you may have, and then you come out the other end and see that this works and you're willing to share your experience with other people, um, thank you so much for doing that. I have a brother and sister who are diabetic and they were, uh, my older brother started following the John McDougall approach uh, and, and then stopped and switched to the keto diet. And he's convinced my sister to do so as well. And I wonder whether you have any advice for how to convince someone who is following the keto diet because they're sure they cannot follow a plant-based diet and counteract diabetic. Yeah. affect symptoms. Okay, um, it's a great question. You know, we have um, in Washington, I think you have them here, these little insects, cicadas, they're in the trees and they kind of buzz, and then they go into the ground, and you don't hear of them for another 17 years, I think it is, then they come back again. While they're in the ground, they write books about <laughs> uh, low-carbohydrate diets. And then they come back, and it started out, it was called Atkins, and then it was called South Beach, and now it's called Keto. Um, uh, it, it, in some ways, a ketogenic diet might have been better than whatever diet they had been following in the past, um, if that diet was a lot of sodas and, and junk. Um, they might be taking some of those things out, and that can be helpful. Um, also, carbohydrate is about half of what people eat, so if people eliminate half of what they eat, they will lose weight. Unfortunately, they're eliminating a good half, um, if it's rice and beans and, and sweet potatoes and healthy foods like that. Um, over the long run, people following that kind of approach have two particular problems. One is that normally cholesterol levels should fall with any kind of weight loss, except on keto. On a ketogenic diet, many people will lose weight as their body fat diminishes. Um, but about one in three has their cholesterol go up, sometimes quite dramatically, which is no surprise because you're eating a lot of meat. Um, the other thing is just overall mortality is much higher in low-carb dieters than in other kind of diet diets. So it's kind of an engaging diet. It's got four letters. Sounds kind of sexy, um, but it's not something that we recommend. So. 
Hello, hello. Hey, oh my God, it really is on. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for being here today. I'm a type one diabetic and um, uh, two quick questions. One, you know, when you talk about keto, type ones, they always go to low carb and that's meat and cheese. Um, and so uh, adding fruits and beans can be a bit of a challenge. I'd love some advice on that. And also, uh, there's the question of just how vegan do you have to be to make it work? Like, can I be 95% or 92%? Can I have an egg a month? I mean, or, or is 100% the way you really need to go to see the benefits? Okay, um, two great questions. Um, first of all, for type 1 diabetes, we recommend exactly the same diet as for type 2. Um, it will not get you off your insulin because, because, as you know, because your pancreas isn't making any insulin at all, and so you'll still need some, but you get two benefits. The first is that it reduces the amount of insulin that you need to inject, usually by about 30%. With, it varies a lot from person to person. Um, and the other thing is that all the complications of type 1 diabetes, like type 2, uh, the serious complications relate to your vasculature. Um, the blood vessels of the eyes, or of the lower legs, or of the kidneys. Um, and so you don't want any cholesterol in your diet. You want to really baby your, your arteries and all the, all the blood vessels that branch from them. So you don't want animal fat, you don't want cholesterol. And when, when people eat a plant-based diet, they, they can live a normal life, and they can expect to have a normal life and minimize the risk of complications. With a ketogenic diet, you really uh, can't say that. So your other question was, how vegan do you have to be? Um, any step a person makes is a good step. Everything that you do in this direction is going to be a good, good thing. Um, there are a couple of values of just not having animal products at all. And the first is that for reasons I can't explain, um, when, when people eliminate animal products completely, they do better than a person who eliminates it 90%. It's a little bit like if I have a, a patient with COPD and they were a three-pack-a-day smoker, and they're down to just five cigarettes a day, but they still cough. Um, and then when they finally just aren't smoking anymore, somehow they're just better. Um, and when a person is having a little bit of Velveeta, a little bit of salmon, all things, somehow their cholesterol and things just never quite settle down. The other thing, which might even be bigger, is that if a person is including the foods that caused their problem in the first place, I, I don't mean type 1 diabetes, but type 2 in particular, um, when animal products remain an occasional part of the diet, we never forget our taste for them. And so we always just kind of keep coming back to them. And sometimes that tends to increase. But like as with smoking or alcohol or other things, when you just say, I, th I think I'm going to put a fence between me and that and not have it anymore, um, it's easier to maintain a healthy diet. So those, those are the things that we have observed. Thank you uh, so much uh, just for speaking. And um, I did appreciate the idea of uh, the logic not working because I feel like I'm very logic based and that's how I ended up here. However, my family is not, um, especially my parents. My mom is extremely, like, she has like a long laundry list of issues, including diabetes. And one of the things that I've wondered um, that I've ran into is that her doctors follow the ADA guidelines. How in the world do you break that? misconception that the ADA guidelines are the ones to follow, especially when there's that emotional tie to literally, she call herself the meat and potatoes gal. Um, because I'm also starting to see my grandparents who also have diabetes having some of those memory problems and stuff like that. Like, how do right. you break that barrier if there's like, you know, like there's the logic is already not there and they, they're having a hard time trying? Okay, terrific question. Um, and I think as, as you were speaking, many people are nodding their heads saying, your family's like my family. Um, a couple of things. The American Diabetes Association's guidelines have changed, um, and they continue to evolve. And they now do include a healthy plant-based diet as one of the options. So in fact, the ADA was the first, the first um, organization to publish our data in 2006 in Diabetes Care. That's where the trial that I described was published. Um, and I spoke at ADA, so they're very open to, to ideas like this, and they, they, they would encourage people to follow exactly the diet that I have um, described. And uh, th with family members who are a little reluctant, the big suggestion I have is to always focus on the short term. Um, like, why don't we try this as a family for three weeks? No, no pressure beyond that, but let's do this together. 
and everyone gets a copy of What the Health, their forks over knives, and they watch it together, and they decide, all right, darn it, we'll try it. And after about a three-week period of an experiment, then it becomes easier to, to think about doing it on a more long-term long basis. The other thing I would suggest is if you give family members a book, don't just give them a book. I, I discovered this with my mom. My mom had a high cholesterol level, and I'd give her books and, you know, books I'd written, you know, and, <laughs> like, she would never, you, you know how, like, you, you, you know you can tell when a book hasn't been read? Um, it's like sitting on the coffee table exactly where, where I put it six months ago. Um, anyhow, finally, by the way, my mother um, did change to a vegan diet, um, and it dropped her cholesterol dramatically. But what I learned is that when you give people a book, you've got to put two Post-it notes in somewhere. And you write on the cover another post-it note saying, Dear Mom, I thought of you when I was reading between pages 140 and 150. And she goes to the post-it note, and she reads it like six times. Like, what is, maybe it was before that. And you could do this with a, a DVD also. Uh, right after about minute 35 between there and an hour, Mom, that was you. She will watch that DVD eight times, you know. <laughs> And then she'll call you up and say, what do you mean about the post-it? I say, Mom, I just love you so much. I wanted to seduce you into watching the darn thing. So never give a book without a post-it note. I have type 2 diabetes, but my number's 5.9, but I'm still, well, 5.5, but I'm still overweight. But my question is, I'm suffering from inflammation throughout my body, and they're diagnosing me with three new autonomic diseases. Do I disuse your reverse diabetes book, or do I look up your inflammation? Um, okay. Start testing foods. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that you're dealing with these, these challenges, and, and you're not alone. There are other people who are, who are as well, um, and I hope all goes super well. Um, I should also say that nothing that I am s discussing here takes the place of having good diagnostic care from your own personal physician and um, looking at what could be aggravating these things. And so you want to make sure that those bases are covered. That said, um, many, many people who have type 2 diabetes have lots of other things, um, and including inflammatory conditions. And what we do is we start with a low-fat vegan diet. That eliminates some of the main inflammatory triggers, like dairy products, or perhaps eggs or meat. But dairy is, is a really, really a big one. And for many people, that's kind of all they need to do is a low-fat vegan diet. But if a person has a condition like rheumatoid arthritis or Sjogren's disease or even asthma, these are autoimmune conditions, there are sometimes other dietary triggers that can be bugging them too. And so we use an elimination diet where we take all those triggers out. Um, for example, like citrus fruit, totally healthy for, for almost everybody, except if that's your trigger, then you can't have citrus. Um, so uh, we have an organized way of doing an elimination diet that you can try, but I would first just start with just a regular low-fat vegan diet and see how it goes. If you want to see that um, elimination diet, you'll see it in my book, Foods That Fight Pain, and I also put an updated version in a book I wrote a year or so ago called The Cheese Trap, which I wrote for all of my um, research participants who say, the one food I really miss is cheese. So. Um, there, there's reasons why, and so you'll see the elimination diet there too. Does that answer your question? So it's a cheese trap. What was the first one? Uh, there's a food called a, a book called Foods That Fight Pain. F Foods That oh, Fight Pain. It, it, come, it came it came out like 20 years ago, um, and the cheese trap came out a couple of years ago. So anyway, I hope you have a chance to pick them up at a library and, and see if they help help you. I want to thank you for being here and thank you for reading, for writing the 21 Day Kickstart book. I read it in April 2012 and was able to keep my gallbladder. I was having lots of painful gallstone pain, and against my doctor's wishes, I changed my diet and was able to keep my gallbladder because I don't like having Good surgery. Um, I was solid vegan for four and a half years. It kind of fell off the wagon about two years. It kind of became a dessert vegetarian, and I don't feel as good, and muffin top is back. So I'm, today I'm hoping to get back on track, but my question is, um, I also had started incorporating juicing. I know fiber is very important, but I kind of wanted your take on um, what your thought is like having a juice a day or doing like a short, you know, juicing fast because it kind of gives your digestive system a rest. Yeah, um, about juicing. I think juicing is fine. Um, some people will say, wait a minute, aren't you better off with the, eating the carrot instead of carrot juice or the orange instead of orange juice? And that's, that's true. You know, the, the fiber and pulp are, are valuable. But on the other hand, for m many people when they're, where they're juicing, they're juicing in addition to other things that they're eating, they're really boosting their, their, their plant food intake. Um, for some folks, it's really kind of like a medicine. So I think juicing is a-okay. 
have two quick questions for you. First one is, what is your opinion on uh, long-term fasting? So various different forms of fasting, uh, various different lengths, water versus juice. And the second question is uh, more short-term fasting, such as intermittent fasting, which is uh, more of a fad in our society, but there's still a lot of documentaries and people propping that up as well. Okay, great question. Um, for long-term fasting, um, Many people can benefit from that, I'm convinced. I've seen people where their inflammation is kind of off, kind of like what you were asking about, where their inflammation is off the scale. And somehow, when, the, when people just aren't eating, they do better and things calm down. But it's dangerous um, and is not something to be done without really good supervision. And there's a place in Santa Rosa, California called True North, where there's a doctor there in the building who will see you every day on your water fast and will make sure that you're okay. It's not something to be just done casually. Um, intermittent fasting is something where you can eat less food for a couple of days each week. That's um, safer. Um, and I think it's perfectly fine, and if you, if you enjoy it, I think it's okay. If it's being used as a substitute for a healthy diet, like I'm going to indulge five days and try to make up for it on two other days, I wouldn't do it like that. Um, and I'm also convinced that if a person is on a really healthful diet, they don't really have to fast at all. Um, I fasted yesterday between 9.30 and 11 a.m., um, <laughs> and that's, that's kind of where I leave it from myself. Hi, Dr. Barnard. I am wondering, um, do you have any carbohydrate restriction with your uh, type 2 diabetics on this diet? Okay, do we have any carbohydrate restriction? No, not with regard to quantity. Um, but we do encourage people to, um, well, I guess two things. One is if you are using your carbohydrate intake to calibrate your insulin dose, then you might have to count how much you consume just like anybody else. But our hope, obviously, is to get you to be able to use less and less insulin, hopefully none at all. Um, so you, you may have to count it. Uh, this is very, this is unusual, but it, it happens. Um, we don't limit the amount, but we do encourage people to have highest, higher quality carbohydrates. And what we use is something called the glycemic index. And you'll, you'll, you'll see this in things that we've written, and you'll see it on our website, too. Um, in a nutshell, the, the glycemic index was invented by David Jenkins at the University of Toronto. And white bread makes your blood sugar rise pretty quickly, so that's high glycemic index. Rye bread is more gentle on your blood sugar, and that's lower glycemic index, or pumpernickel even lower. Um, or sugar raises your blood sugar really fast, but fruit tastes sweet, but it doesn't raise your blood sugar as much. So fruit is lower glycemic index. So we shift from high to low, and the rules are really, really simple. Um, if, if you go online, you'll see a million charts that will drive you crazy. But sugar, no. Fruit, yes. Uh, white potatoes, not as good as sweet potatoes. Um, typical dry cereals are not as good, particularly if they have a, a toy inside. They tend to, <laughs> they will raise your blood sugar, whereas bran cereal or oatmeal are, are better choices. Um, that's kind of it. There are a few surprises. Pasta is low, fairly low GI, even if it's a white pasta. Beans, super low. And that's kind of it. So you're choosing those foods, and that's what, that's the way we do it. Doctor, I have read PCRM.com over the years and have learned so much from it. If you could expound on two points. One, the difference in the length of the intestines between a herbivore and a carnivore and how important that is. And second, the amount of protein needed as we go into our senior years. Okay. Um, Great points, and just really quickly, um, if there are carnivores in the world like cats, and just like us, um, as meat goes through the digestive tract, um, carcinogens are formed and lots of other unhealthy things. So a carnivore typically has a very short intestinal tract to expel those things quickly. Herbivores are eating something completely different. They're not eating meat, so they don't have to expel those things, but they're eating lots of fibery foods, so they have a longer digestive tract that allows them to extract the nutrients and, and also to extract the water that's an intrinsic part of it. So if you look at a human's intestinal tract, it's, it's that of an herbivore rather than, than a, a carnivore. Um, your other question was about... Oh, protein and aging. Um, there, there are people who, who will say that as you get older, you, you need more protein because you're, you're absorbing or using it less efficiently. That may be true, but the numbers aren't huge. Um, you know, the people who make 
uh, liquid supplements would like you to believe you need an enormous amount um, of added protein. Um, the, the differences from what I have seen are rather trivial and can be easily accomplished on a plant-based diet. Dr. Barnard, just thank you so, so much for your time and the education and empowerment. So they diagnosed me with MS years ago, totally plant-based, no medicine, phenomenal vegan life. Question, two questions. Vitamin D has been the new thing now, okay, and checked vitamin D levels. I'm a, veter I'm a veteran and the vitamin D issue has been an issue. And then you mentioned fish oils, okay, and eliminating oils, which I agree to. Right. But are you okay with a plant-based omega oil from plant oils? What do you think about that? Okay, great. Um, what a good audience this is. This is like a PhD in nutrition. Um, yes, um, great, great questions. Um, vitamin D um, is needed for, um, to allow your body to absorb calcium from the foods you eat. It also appears to have uh, a cancer preventive function, although that's less clear and less known, but likely true. Um, and vitamin D normally comes from sunlight on our skin. Um, and w obviously human beings began in equatorial Africa and we could get all the sunlight we wanted, but some of us had the bad judgment to leave a nice place like that and end up in New Jersey. Um, <laughs> and um, there's not as much sun there. Um, and so you can, you can become vitamin D deficient. Um, and if you use a sunscreen, even here in Virginia Beach, you will not make vitamin D. Um, so if, those are the, if that's the situation and you're not able to get the 20 minutes a day of sunlight on your face and arms that will give you vitamin D, um, then you need a supplement. And about 2,000 IUs a day is what people would normally suggest. Um, and then you can get tested and the tests always come back low, which makes me wonder what are they doing in those testing labs. Um, and then some doctors will bump you up to 5,000 or something like that. Um, with regard to um, omega-3, your body has all the machinery it takes to make um, the omega-3s, you, you get alpha, this, alpha, this will not be on the test, um, alpha-linolenic acid is very common in many nuts, many seeds, even uh, vegetables, which don't have much fat, much of it is in the form of omega-3. Then you have enzymes that lengthen it from the 18 carbon one in a plant to the 20 and 22 carbon ones that your brain wants. And you have the enzymes that do that, but if I eat a lot of other fats, in my Snickers bar, um, oily things I cooked with, that ties up those enzymes and makes the, the, the little bit of omega-3 I'm eating not get lengthened. So if we eat a lot of green leafy vegetables, you'll get the traces of omega-3 that they have. And if you're not having a lot of competing fat, you can lengthen them. And if you wish, you can go to the store and they do sell um, what looks like fish oil, but it's um, derived from algae and it's vegan DHA or EPA. Um, they sell it online and it's perfectly fine and there are companies that will actually test your DHA level if you want to and you can get tested and see how you do. The, uh, we don't yet know if there's benefit to that. Fish oil has really kind of plummeted um, in the medical world because it has not turned out to be the, the panacea we thought it was going to be. Um, whether um, Vegan DHA is helpful, I don't know. Where, where people are really focusing on it, would that say protect the brain against Alzheimer's disease? And it, it may be, um, it, it may be. I don't think there's any harm from taking vegan DHA. All right, wonderful question. Um, thank you all for letting me share this time with you. Good luck to you, thank you. Thank you so much.